Hello, thank you for coming to my talk, summarizing my dissertation research. Um, my research was on the niche habitat use and spatial response to climate change by mammals living in the montane region of the Sierra Nevada, particularly the high elevation region. So my overall goal was to quantify and characterize and compare the niches and habitat selection of four mammal species, and then use that information to forecast future distributions in this changing world that we're in. So this has really clear conservation applications, but really understanding species distributions is one of the fundamental goals of ecology itself. So here's the story about why I have these goals. So I'm gonna tell you a story today, a story about three ground dwelling squirrels, the Belding's ground squirrel, the yellow bellied marmot, and the golden mantled ground squirrel, and a small lagomorph, the American pika, and how they all live together high up in the mountains in a land called the Sierra Nevada. And they've lived together in this area for many, many, many generations, but their world is changing. And we don't know for how much longer these neighbors can continue to call these regions their home or each other neighbors. So to answer this question, we need to understand just a little bit more about what makes this such a special home for them in the first place. So this is a bit more about the Sierra Nevada itself. The Sierra Nevada runs along the eastern portion of California for about 600 kilometers, and the range runs from north to south. And this is a very high elevation region. There are a lot of peaks that are over 3,000 meters. Um, that's over 10, about 10,000 feet. And interesting about this range is that the elevation generally increases as you travel from the north to the south. So the tallest mountains towards the southern part of this range are taller than those that are in the northern part of the range. <clears throat> it even reaches about um, 4,421 meters at Mount Whitney towards the southern part of this, of this range. Um, and you can see that higher elevation region shown in this white part of the map here. So the Climate change has already been impacting this region. Over the last 100 years alone, the temperature has increased up to three degrees Celsius in portions of this range. And there have been changes to the precipitation patterns and resulting from that changes to the hydrology and changes to the snow cover. Um, and all of these changes are projected to continue with decreases to snowpack and ongoing drying and likely leading to the loss of many high elevation meadows. And the Sierra Nevada also supports many small mammal species that could be both directly and indirectly impacted by these changes. So this is where our study area was conducted. Our study area is shown by this blue polygon, and it covers nearly the entire subalpine and alpine portions of the Sierra Nevada. Um, and it covers a latitudinal length of 320 kilometers. And here's a little bit more detailed science-based information for our four species. Their geographic distributions in California are shown adjacent to their pictures. Um, so that's right here. And this is our study area for reference. So all four of these species have somewhat similar life histories. They're generally sympatric within their range within California. They're diurnal. They overlap somewhat in space and diet and habitat use. And really interestingly, Although the ground squirrel species have been fairly well studied physiologically and behaviorally, much of the natural history knowledge about their environmental requirements, their habitat requirements in California is anecdotal and qualitative. When, if you follow a lot of the habitat requirements references back through the literature, um, they often lead to Grinnell's um, work from 100 years ago. So there have been limited quantitative studies about the environmental requirements for those species, especially over large portions of their range. And having only that kind of more general or qualitative information makes it difficult to answer questions about which factors are driving their current distribution without being very speculative. And it also makes it harder to model accurately. So two of these ground squirrels based on what we know they're thought to be meadow dependent. So that's the Belding's ground squirrel and the yellow-bellied marmot. 
And one of them is thought to be more of a generalist, that's the golden mantle ground squirrel. And uh, the American pika here, it's known to depend on rocks. And the pika is comparatively well studied for its habitat requirements, its environmental requirements, and there's been many distribution models on this species. So it provides a good point of reference for our models as well. And uh, in addition to life history, previous studies have actually looked at range retractions for these species over the last 100 years in the Sierra Nevada, um, like the Grinnell Resurvey Project. And we have seen that the building's ground squirrel has experienced range retractions. Um, and the golden mantle ground squirrel and the pika have as well, but much more limited and only in portions of the state. And so far, we haven't seen any range retractions um, for the yellow-bellied marmot documented in California. So as, as I mentioned before, the climate is changing and a changing climate will influence mammal distributions directly through things like the physiological requirements related to temperature and precipitation. But climate can also have an indirect effect such as changes to the distribution of the habitat that these mammals depend on. And there are a number of different ways that species uh, can respond to change environmental conditions. Some are going to be able to adapt evolutionarily. Some are going to be able to change their life history patterns, like their phenology. Um, there are some species that will go extinct. And there are many species who will shift their geographic ranges to track suitable niche space as it shifts geographically. We've seen this in the fossil record. That's shown by the figure on the right. These lines are isoclines, so um, time. And this shows oak trees expanding their range to the north following glacial retreat over the past 15,000 years. And you can see here that this generally is expanding in a poleward direction. And it's often assumed that species will move to higher altitudes and higher latitudes to escape the effects of warming. However, although those poleward um, and higher elevation shifts are often anticipated, they're not always the case for all species. And this is really relevant because we need to know if there are protected or, or otherwise suitable areas for species where their future range is likely to be. So this is what we've seen when we've observed range shifts in the fossil record. The blue dots on these graphics represent where species were found overlapping in the fossil record. And the shaded areas are their current distribution. And you can see that although some species did shift poleward, other species appear to have done the exact opposite. Um, there's been shifts away from the poles or even in decreasing in elevation. And as I mentioned, there have been um, early, uh, more recent studies looking at changes to geographic distribution in the last 100 years. Um, and what we see is that species are not responding in a uniform way to that changing environment. These studies found little consistency in the directionality of rain shifts and species responses to that changing environment were idiosyncratic. So we know that future latitudinal or altitudinal shifts um, are unlikely to be uniform. We need to consider how individual species are likely to respond to the changes that are forecast. And that's because forecasting future species distributions is often used for management. It's often used for conservation efforts. So the better our forecasting can be, the better the conservation decisions we can make based on that forecasting. And so we really need to understand better which variables are driving these individual species distributions currently so that we can better forecast how those distributions might change in the future. And this is especially important for high elevation mammals. These mammals are particularly vulnerable to a changing climate. They've often got very specific physiological tolerances, and these have allowed them to thrive in these really extreme environments to begin with. But it also means that their ability to disperse to um, areas that are lower in elevation or might be unsuitable environments are more limited. And they can't fly from mountaintop to mountaintop. Um, so species that are high elevation and also depend on montane meadows are going to face additional challenges because those changing hydrologic regimes and also tree encroachment are predicted um, to, to result in the loss of many meadows. And both of these are predicted as the result of climate change. 
So our field data, observations of these four species were collected along walking transects. These uh, transects are shown by these green polygons here. There were 21 total transects. Each one of these transects was 10 kilometers in length. And they were surveyed three to four times each summer um, from mid-June to about late August over five consecutive years from 2008 to 2012. So this blue polygon here is our study area. And you can see that it mostly aligns with the American Pika range shown by this purple line right here. But that overall, the range in this area is similar for all four of the species that we're, that we're looking at. Um, and that by, with, with the pica, we get the area of, by choosing the, the study area along where the pica is, we get the area where these species overlap. Um, there were four transects at least each in the southern, central, and northern regions of the Sierra Nevada. And our survey area was primarily along the crest of this range with an elevational gradient of 2,700 meters to 3,700 meters. From these surveys, we have a combined total of 8,383 observations of individuals of these four mammal species. In addition to the species data um, that were collected through observations, we used existing environmental spatial, da spatial data layers for our models. The environmental predictor variables that we used to build our models were based on a combination of land cover, topography, and climate at those species observation points. All of these types of variables are known to influence the geographic range of species. Um, we obtained the, the land cover spatial data layers from CalVeg at a one hectare resolution. The topography variables were derived from USGS data. And I used climate data from different sources um, for some of the different chapters. For the distribution forecasting, we used WorldClim for both the current and future distributions. And for the niche, I used the ClimSurf database um, at 860 meter resolution. Um, the ClimSurf database was a climate model developed in 2014, focused on the Western US, and it was developed as part of the larger project my project was part of. Um, and again, for, for the future uh, distribution for forecast, we use downscale data for both the current and future climates from the WorldClim database, particularly the BioClim variables at one kilometer resolution. All right, so to do this, we um, broke it into three steps. The first step was to quantify the niche. The second, once that was done, use what we found as what was driving um, the variables to look at what sort of variation there was in habitat use and then feed that into the predictors and look at what is driving both the current and future distributions for these species. So step one, quantifying the niche and identifying important predictor variables for the current distribution. Before we get into quantifying the niche, I wanted to share some quotes about it. I just, um, I love seeing some of the thoughts and opinions about the niche concept in the literature over time. And these were two of my favorites, um, particularly before I share using the niche. So from 1972, I think it's good practice to avoid the term niche whenever possible. And then from 1991, most ecologists would agree that the niche is a central concept of ecology, even though we do not know exactly what it means. So because there are so many different definitions of the niche, I need to explain how we're using it in this study. And I'm going to define it somewhat in terms of the analysis that we used. And I'll talk more about the analysis in the next few slides. But conceptually, it builds on both the Grinnellian and the Hutchinsonian concepts of the niche. It takes into account both the habitat requirements of the species and then uses that to build a theoretical space of those requirements. And the, the ecological niche theory has been used to describe and quantify the range of environmental conditions where a species is likely to persist, and that's what we're doing here. And the analysis that I used is called the ecological niche factor analysis, um, also called ENFA, and it's a factor analysis, um, and it, in multidimensional space that's built of environmental variables, it identifies the ecological niche as the space where the focal species has a reasonable probability to occur. 
Um, and in the process of doing so, it identifies the important predictors of a species occurring there. And I wanted to know what those predictors were. And this analysis is a factor analysis. Um, it transforms correlated environmental variables like temperature and elevation into uncorrelated variables. And in some respects, this is similar to PCA, but in this situation, the uncorrelated factors for the ecological niche factor analysis are measures of marginality and specialization. Marginality is a way to measure the magnitude of selection. How different is the used niche space compared to the niche space that's available on the landscape to that species? And then specialization is a way to measure the narrowness of the niche. How specific are the requirements of this species, again, when compared to the available range of conditions? Uh, do the, does the precipitation vary on the landscape by 20 centimeters, but we only find the species where the precipitation is between 15 to 17 centimeters. Um, so that would be a measure of how specialized it is. So this, these graphics show you what this looks like in three-dimensional space here on the left. This orange is the available environment and this purple is what a species would be found using. And then this light gray and dark gray represents what this three-dimensional space would look like if it was projected onto a flat surface. So this light gray would be what was available and the dark gray would represent the used niche space. Um, and again, this is the available niche space and the used niche space. And then taking it a step further, this is what the actual plots look like when we get the results of our analysis. And I'll, I'll talk more about this plot in a minute, but available and used. All right, so this is what we want to get out of this analysis. For this first part of the study, we're only looking at the ground dwelling squirrels. The American pike and niche is being evaluated as another part of the overall project. So as these species overlap spatially at both local and regional scales, and in many areas of their natural history, we do anticipate finding differences in their niche space, um, the, a, a, a bit like the competitive exclusion principle. Um, and we wanted to know what are the most important factors defining the niche space for each of these species, which of the niche factors are different um, from other similar species, and by what magnitude are they different. And we wanted to know these things because that's going to influence how differently these different species might respond to these future environmental changes. So this is the visualization, the plots of the marginality and specialization for the three ground-dwelling squirrel species. These lines are arrow vectors, and they're showing the different variables that were driving the niche space for these species. The longer the vector arrow, the more important that variable is as a driver. And again, the light gray area represents the available niche space, what's available to that species on the landscape, and the dark gray is what that species was using. So the center point on the graph is the centroid of the available niche space. And when the used niche space is shifted um, to the right of that, it indicates the magnitude of selection by the magnitude of that shift. That's the marginality, the magnitude of differential use. And then the vertical compression of the used niche space is a measure of how specialized that species is. The narrower the used niche space is, the more specialized the species. And I do know that the font is a bit small for on-screen viewing, but the take-home message is that these are not all the same. You can see that the this shift to the right, as well as the vertical compression, is greatest in our most specialist species, the Belding's ground squirrel, especially when compared to the more generalist golden mantle ground squirrel. However, all of these species are selectively using the environment compared to that which is available. Even when we have limited the area that we're looking at to just the high elevation Sierra Nevada, these species are being selective in their use. So because the individual variation is very important, let's talk about the individual variables driving these differences. Um, again, this was represented by the arrow vectors in the niche factor analysis plot. And we're gonna start with our most specialist species, the Belding's ground squirrel. This is a meadow specialist, and we found that this species overall selects for areas with meadows. 
And it also selects for area with higher precipitation levels. Um, the building's ground squirrel specialization was driven by the slope, which does make sense as meadows are in flat areas. Um, and the specialization was also driven by cold season temperatures. So not too hot and not too cold in the winter. It is particularly interesting that this species overall selected for areas with higher precipitation levels in our study, because <clears throat> earlier studies by Morelli et al found that higher precipitation levels during the wet season were associated with extirpations at the trailing edge for this species. So it might have been that higher precipitation levels at those lower elevations are more detrimental um, than at higher elevations where they seem to be important. And this species elevational range extends from 550 meters to 3000 meters. And our study only looked at 2,700 to 3,700 meters, so the upper edge of this species um, elevational range. Um, but it really highlights the importance that precipitation levels have for this species, but not in a uniform direction. More precipitation or less precipitation is not always better. There are other interacting factors. So it, it might be that the effects that the form that the precipitation falls in um, whether it's rain or if it's snow, whether it's providing cover or maybe making these species flood out burrows. So we, we need to consider the effects of precipitation on, on many different things for these species, um, as well as interacting factors. We can't just say whether or not precipitation is good or bad. There's a lot of other things, um, such as interaction with elevation that we need to take into account. This also has implications as the snow level moves up in elevation in a warming world. Um, if those, you know, if precipitation changing from snow to rain is detrimental. Okay, moving on to our charismatic wormets. The presence of meadows um, for this species was unsurprisingly also an important driving variable. And even though our study only considered these high elevation spaces, Elevation, which is a proxy for other variables, was still a really important predictor for the presence for this species. Um, and that might be because it is, is taking into account things like temperature and precipitation patterns. Cooler temperatures in both the summer and the winter were important specialization factors for the yellow-bellied marmot. And the narrowness of the niche was driven by temperature constraints. So again, even, even when compared to an overall cool environment, this species specializes in areas with comparatively cool winters and summers and meadows at high elevations. Even when we're just looking at the subalpine and alpine zone, those high elevation meadows are really important. Um, also, when we look at other studies that were done in this region, we know, um, and actually the studies that were done in other regions, um, we know that the presence of rocks within meadows is an important component of the marmot habitat. And that didn't show up from this analysis. And so we realized that we need to look at finer spatial scales um, to be sure to incorporate that really important component that we're not gonna see um, at the resolution for the environmental data that we looked at um, for this analysis. All right, and finally, we get to our generalist, the gold mantled ground squirrel. Um, and this is a species a lot of people are familiar with if you've gone up to the Sierra Nevada. Um, it will scamper over picnic tables and steal your bagel. And this is one that um, people will often confuse with chipmunks. It is a fairly adaptable species. I've, I have seen it run across a parking lot with a bagel before. And it selects for areas with conifers, higher warm season temperatures, and more snow-free days. So you would think that this species would be um, would do pretty fantastic under the changes predicted under the climate change scenarios. Um, but some studies that looked at the change of distribution for these species over the last hundred years showed that at least in central California, the species has experienced range retractions um, that weren't observed in the northern and southern portion of the Sierra Nevada. So uh, we might speculate that we do see that higher levels of precipitation weren't good for this species, and that might already be more important at lower elevations. A again, keep in mind that our study was conducted above the elevation of that zone of contraction. So as those snow levels move up the mountainside, 
and precipitation might be detrimental to species in this way, in, in a way that overwhelms its tolerance of those warmer conditions. So I, I think, you know, this is speculation, but I think it is important to remember that species who are generally more flexible in their requirements still might be vulnerable to changing conditions in unanticipated ways. So overall, in summary, comparing these species, the presence of meadows was the most important factor driving marginality, driving the magnitude of selection for both Belding's ground squirrel and yellow-bellied marmot. And the marginality of the golden-mantled ground squirrel was most influenced by conifers, snow-free days and those summer temperatures kind of equally. And wet and dry season precipitation amounts strongly drove marginality but not specialization for all three of these species. Um, interestingly, those measures were negatively associated with marginality for the golden-mantled ground squirrel and the yellow-bellied marmot, but positively associated for the buildings, possibly showing a key distinction in niche space use and why we might see <clears throat> um, the, some different space use even within this region. Um, slope and topographic roughness index, TRI, um, both of these were highly correlated. They were important factors driving specialization for all of these species. And so it really understand, it underscores the importance of topographic variables on species niche space, even if it's a proxy for other variables like the slopes that might be able to support a well-drained meadow. Um, we need to take in topography. It's not just climate. We need to take into account things like topography. The overall marginalization for all three of these species was driven by a combination of topography, climate, and land cover type, not just climate. And I found this really interesting. So Slater et al. recently examined a correlation between the niche breadth of a species and the extent of its geographic range. Um, Slater looked at this across 64 other studies, and there was a significant positive relationship. The greater the niche breadth, the greater the geographic range. And our study here is in line with those findings. Across these three species, as their niche breadth increased, that corresponded with a larger overall total geographic range. And with these studies, it's often thought that a larger niche breadth in species with a larger geographic distribution might just be because the niche itself is being measured over these larger areas. So there's more heterogeneity over these larger geographic extents. There's more variability. And that might lead to apparently a broader niche. But in this case, with our study, we determined the niche breadth only in an area where these three species were San Patrick removing the different geographic extent as a confounding factor. And our results still followed the predicted pattern of a broader niche space with um, corresponding to larger ranges. So to summarize, again, each species does have a unique niche when compared to the others that we evaluated. Um, the overall magnitude of the niche was driven by a combination of ecogeographical variables, not just climate. Um, and because of that, we do expect these species to respond in different ways um, as the environment changes, as the climate changes, but also even when we're just considering spatial distribution, so Gleasonian instead of Clemensian. Um, so because of this, we are also thinking that these species might have variation in how they're using habitats in different portions of their range. And that gets to our second step, evaluating habitat use patterns across multiple spatial and temporal scales. And now we're going back to looking at this for all four species. I'd like to, to start out this section with, this, with a quote. Um, I think this quote captures really nicely the challenges of trying to figure out why species live where they do. So this is uh, Aldo Leopold. When the game manager asks themselves, whether a given piece of land is suitable for a given species of game, they must realize that they are asking no simple question, but rather they are facing one of the great enigmas of animate nature. An answer good enough for practical purposes is usually easy to get by the simple process of noting whether the species is there and ready or whether it occurs on similar range nearby. But let them not be cocksure about what is similar. 
for this involves the deeper question of why a species occurs in one place and not in another, which is probably the same as why it persists at all. No living person can answer that question fully in even one single instance. Okay, so with that, let's try and figure out why these species persist at all. Um, and we're going to quantify how similar these species find habitats that we have labeled as the same. From the niche analysis, we know that in this area, climate is not the important variable driving distribution. Land cover is a key determinant. Um, but when we looked at when that niche analysis we conducted was at really broad temporal and spatial scales. Five years of data were collapsed, the entire survey area was collapsed, and it was based on um, habitat data at data at one hectare resolution. And from the literature, we know that many species use habitats. At, um, differently at different areas of their geographic range. And we know that habitat use or habitat selection is intrinsically a scale sensitive process. So habitat use should be evaluated at multiple um, biologically meaningful scales so that we can more fully understand these underlying patterns of selection that are driving these distributions. So Looking for our study, we wanted to know how consistent these species were in their use of different habitat types in our study area. Um, we wanted to know if there was variation in habitat use, both at temporal and spatial scales. So our second goal here is to quantify any variation in habitat use over space and time, considering micro and macro habitat use for each of those. Um, temporal variation was measured as interannual variation, and spatial variation was among the different transects. And so the availability of habitat at the transect level was based on the habitats that were available within a 500 meter buffer of the transect. Um, when we looked at availability at the regional level, we combined all of those transect buffers. The micro scale data was based on direct observations by the field crew. Keep this in mind as it's gonna be important later. At each one of these occurrence locations, the surveyors noted what type of habitat that animal was sitting on. Um, and it's the, the dominant habitat within a three meter radius around that observation. And that is what we consider our micro scale habitat data. Um, and the macro scale shown here, that again was the CalVeg data layers. Um, ba based on GPS locations of those, those observations, again, at a one hectare resolution. Um, note these symbols. I'm going to be using them throughout the rest of this talk. I'm using the symbols to make it a little easier. This orange is always going to mean macro scale, and the blue will mean micro scale. I kind of tried to show that with these blue dots in the orange. Um, at each one of those scales, we consider four land cover variables, Spatial, dis spatial differences between the 21 transects, temporal variation across five years across four species. And so it can be a bit much to track. So bear with me with some of the symbols that I'm using to, to bring everybody along. Um, and if you think it's confusing to hear about, it was a bear to write about. All right, the analysis. So to quantify habitat use, we used a resource selection function. This is a function where the value for a resource unit is proportional to the probability of that unit being used. When a use resource is used disproportionately to its availability, the use is considered selective. Um, and if you, you get a value of one from that analysis, it means that the animal is being neutral in its selection. It's using the habitat in proportion to the availability of the habitat on the landscape. If the value is less than one, that's showing avoidance. Um, it's, it's showing that the species is using it less than it's available on the landscape. The value is greater than one, that shows positive selection, that it's selecting it more than its availability on the landscape. Um, and it, the, the more selective it is, the larger above one it's going to be. If the value is zero, we didn't see that species using that at all. Um, we calculated the standard error and 95% confidence intervals for each species and habitat type by year and transect, and confidence intervals that overlapped one indicate proportional use of habitat neutral selections. 
So this first set of graphs is looking at the habitat use by all four species, collapsing all of the data we have among transects and years into one. Um, so this doesn't show the variation yet, just the average, but I wanted to also get everybody familiar uh, with what this will look like. So the macro scale selection is shown in the top plots with the orange around it. Um, and the micro is shown in the blue on the bottom plot. And this is gonna be consistent for the remainder of these slides. Um, the Y axis in this case shows the selection ratio. And again, one with this line indicates, oops, this line indicates neutral selection, this dashed line here. Um, it, if the value is here, it shows that that species is using it in proportion to its availability on the landscape. The four um, land cover types that we considered are conifers, meadows, rocks, and shrubs. And these colors representing those will also be consistent going forward. Brown for conifers, green for meadows, gray for rocks, and yellow for shrubs. The first thing that I want you to note um, is that the selection for meadows is strong by both the building and the marmot, but it is stronger in the buildings. And that is consistent whether we're looking at the macro or the micro scale. Um, the other thing that is consistent is that selection is stronger at the micro scale for both species. And I believe what this indicates is that even in areas mapped as other habitat types in CalVeg, like mapped as rocks or mapped as conifers, these species were found using, in this case, meadows that were inclusions within those other habitat types. So it would be a small meadow area within a big slab of rock or um, a meadow area within a conifer area. And this is especially true for the buildings. Overall, the golden mantle ground squirrel pretty much used the habitat in proportion to its availability, showing slight preference for conifers and meadows. And really interestingly, at the macro scale, the American pika didn't really show much selectivity. Um, and that's, I mean, we know this is a specialist species. And so that one hectare resolution is just too low. It's only when we look at the observer scale, the field observations, that the importance of rocks really becomes apparent for this species. Um, and I'll talk about a bit more about that later. But our next question is, do they vary over space and time? So these plots are the same as before, except those points are now um, stretched out across four years of the study, so 2009 to 2012. Um, the first thing that I want to point out is if there was not a change in the amount of selection, these lines would all be straight and horizontal. So these are not all straight and horizontal. There are changes in the strength of selection between the years. There is some annual variation. And there could be a lot of reasons for this. Um, there were substantial differences in the amount and the type of precipitation across these years. There was drought, there was some years with very heavy snowfall, um, and that's gonna affect these different species differently. Um, but it, it shows that there is something driving differences in selection across years. And uh, let's see. Oh, the transects included in this temporal analysis were only those that were surveyed in all years of the evaluation. Um, and I, because of that, only 2009 to 2012 are included, along with a subset of the transects that were fairly evenly distributed over our study area. So now we're moving on to spatial variability. The Sierra Nevada itself is a very heterogeneous region spatially. There's different temperatures, precipitation patterns, and really different elevations depending where you are in this range. And that results in different structure of the habitats and different proportions of the habitat available in those different regions. These are actually photos um, from along the transects and, and in the different regions. And there are major differences in what makes up a conifer forest or what makes up a rocky area um, in the, the different areas of the Sierra Nevada. And so that results in really complex habitat patterns and possibly different types of selection in those different regions. These pie charts here show the proportion of habitat that's available in each of our 21 transects. And I know that it's hard to see, but they're not all the same and they can vary a lot. 
So to start with, this is looking at spatial variation. This is all four species at the macro scale. You notice the orange right here. <clears throat> the x-axis shows each individual transect organized as they occur on the uh, in the Sierra Nevada, going from north to south. The proportion of the land cover types available in those transects, again, it's shown by these pie charts along the bottom. <clears throat> the take home here is that, again, these are not all straight horizontal lines. There are different levels and types of selection happening in the different transects, and they can vary by a lot. And there are really key differences between the species as well. And there's a lot to unpack here. So we're going to look at each species individually to just give some examples of interesting findings when we look at these spatial differences. So here's looking at spatial variability for the building's ground squirrel and now looking at both the macro and the micro scales. Overall, although there is some variation in the strength of selection, we saw, looking at the overall values, that Belding's ground squirrel consistently selects for meadows. Um, and those, again, are shown in green. And the strength of selection was much stronger when we look at the micro scale. And where it drops to zero, again, that's where we didn't be, see these, this species at all in those transects. Um, where meadows were scarce on the landscape, um, like transect 18 or 21, 10, and 19, which is sort of roughly near Yosemite, buildings ground squirrels were just absent from those areas. And so this really highlights the importance of meadows for this species. In the far southern part of our study area, which is the right side of these plots, buildings ground squirrels were completely absent despite the prevalence of meadows there. And that southern part of our study area has comparatively lower precipitation and higher temperatures. Um, and so it might be <clears throat> that in this southern region, those climate constraints might be overriding the habitat preferences about whether or not this species can persist there. The pattern that we see for the yellow belly marmot is more complex, is certainly, especially for the other species that we were considering a meadow specialist. Um, still, overall, the strength of selection was much stronger, shown down here at the micro scale. Really interestingly, with this species, there are a number of times when the selection at the micro scale reversed from what was observed at the macro scale. And so this sort of shows that marmots are consistently using different habitat types at those scales. So, for example, in the transects that are, you know, roughly near Yosemite again, there's very little meadow habitat available. And we see that marmots were seen in other habitats in those regions, like in, you know, conifers or shrubs or, you know, basically what was available. But when we look at the micro scale, they were really strongly selecting rocks in these areas. So it looks like the presence of rocks within those other habitat types is really important for them persisting there. Um, and in two transects in, in 16 and 9, um, where meadows are um, more abundant, they're selecting meadows at the macro scale and then rocks again at the micro scale. And this is just another example of, about how important rocks can be and how they only show up when we're looking at the right biologically meaningful scale of analysis for this species. So we know from, from earlier studies in other regions that rocks are important for predator avoidance, for basking for this species. Um, and that's a distinction that would have been missed in our models if we just looked at selection using a GIS layer. Um, again, it really, I think, highlights the importance of field observations in trying to determine where species might be able to um, persist in the future. So, <clears throat> Although you know, our, our generalist doesn't show really strong selection, there are patterns, there's clear patterns. Overall, conifers are an important component of the habitat, whether we're looking at the macro or the micro scale. Um, but there are times for this species when meadows is selected stronger um, at the macro scale. There are times when meadows or rocks are selected at the micro scale. And one of the things that, that we found interesting is that it seems to depend on a variety of habitats. And where one habitat is available at lower amounts in a certain transect 
it will show a preference for their rarer habitat type. Um, for example, in transect 18, there's very little meadow um, and even less rock. And the species actually showed the strongest selection we have seen for those habitat ty types in that transect. And it doesn't show up here because the strength is so strong, it's actually off the chart. So, um, it's, so it's interesting to see that the strength of preference for rocks in gray at the micro scale, um, but that doesn't show up at the macro scale. Similar to the marmot, this is probably a sign of how important rocks are possibly as perches within those other habitat types. Um, so again, although we consider this to be a generalist species, it might not be that it can persist in any environment, but that it de depends on a variety of environments to meet all of its life history requirements, possibly you know, different sources of food at different times of the year. All right, and on to the American pika. So for the pika, we found that at the macro scale, uh, the land cover type selected for um, was actually different in the different transects. We could see that there were shrubs and some rocks and the other, sometimes it was meadows. Um, it, we know that rocks are important for these species, but at that macro scale, it only selected for rock in four of the trans transects, which is about equivalent to the number of times it selected for shrubs or meadows. Um, so the only consistent thing that we saw was that it um, selected against conifers in, in most of the transects. But that, that pattern totally changes when we look at the micro scale. At the micro scale, the pika consistently selected most strongly for rocks in every transect. And they were absent at the transects of the far north and far south, which had very few rocks. So you've heard me mention it a few times about the pattern of the strength of selection changing. So one of the interesting things that we saw was that as the strength of selection for preferred habitat, um, it tended to, to increase as that habitat got rarer on the landscape. Again, this is for preferred habitat. And that, that pattern was stronger at the micro scale. And these graphs are just a subsample of all the comparisons that we ran. And these are at the micro scale, so these are based on direct observations. In this case, the x-axis is the proportion of habitat that's available on the landscape, and the y-axis is the, the manly selectivity measure. So this is the resource selection function. The larger the number than one is, the greater the strength of selection. Um, and I can speculate um, that when there is very little of the preferred habitat, that we might see this pattern because if there's less suitable areas on the landscape, maybe we don't see the animals moving between these suitable patches um, when we're doing surveys as often. Um, and again, it's important to keep in mind that these plots are just showing you the, where um, the transects where the species occurred so we could get a measurement to plot it. But what we saw on those earlier slides is that if there wasn't enough of that suitable habitat present, we just didn't find the species there. And so the pattern is that the strength of selection increased as the habitat got rare on the landscape up until the point that that species just didn't persist there anymore. So if you're trying to use resource selection uh, strength as an indicator of overall habitat quality, you might actually be measuring the exact opposite. So these plates are from two books by Grinnell and Grinnell and Storr, published in the early part of the 20th century. And they represent at least uh, three of my study species, the golden mantle ground squirrel, the bellings ground squirrel, and the yellow-bellied marmot. And I wanted to share with you the, the qualitative observations of habitat use from these natural history studies. Um, this is from Animal Life in the Yosemite in, uh, let's see. That the main habitat or niche of the golden mantled ground squirrel is the open rock strewn floor of the sparse lodgepole pine forest. It keeps closely to this sort of environment, while the belding squirrel inhabits the open meadows. At the margins of the meadows, however, the two are often seen in association. And I just want to point out that this qualitative description is largely in agreement with our quantitative one. Um, and this is an example of how results like this look like from a natural history point of view. 
And I really want to emphasize the value of natural history observations for interpreting these model results, especially to make sure that you're looking at things at the right scale. Um, and although we need to quantify these things, like we need to quantify the niche and habitat use to be able to model these changes, these direct natural history observations are critical to making sure that we are interpreting the analysis in a biologically meaningful way. So in summary, habitat use for all three of, or sorry, all four of these species varies really dramatically, whether we're looking at different regions, um, possibly responding to different environmental conditions in those areas. It can vary a lot from year to year, possibly changes by different annual precipitation patterns or temperature. Um, and habitat selection is also different for the same species, whether or we're looking at it at the micro or macro scale. And sometimes which habitat is most preferred at these scales can even reverse. Um, and habitat elements on the landscape, they're often distributed in a hierarchical manner. So the overall heterogeneity is greater um, at greater spatial extents than at smaller spatial extents. And analysis conducted at these larger extents and based on coarse grain spatial data really do miss important patterns of habitat use that only show up at these, at these finer scales, um, like specific habitat features within a home range. For those of you that are familiar with Johnson's orders of selection, this would be the third order of selection. So studies like ours covering these large extents they often rely just on spatial databases that have these more coarse grain spatial resolution. And this is for very reasonable practical considerations, but those spatial databases miss heterogeneity that's, that's present at those finer spatial scales, like you know, rocks within a meadow or rocks within a shrub area. Um, and this is particularly apparent when considering microhabitat specialist species like the pika or the building's ground squirrel. So for species like this that are, that are specialists, conducting habitat use analysis only um, at the spatial scale that's allowed by spatial data layers will ultimately give the illusion that those species are more flexible in their habitat requirements than they really are. And this is something to consider if we're looking at species from that we don't know as well from museum records and things like that. All right, so now we're getting to the heart of the question that I asked at the beginning, to figure out what might happen to these species in the Sierra Nevada with climate change. We know that high elevation um, species are vulnerable to a changing climate. We know that climate change is already impacting the Sierra Nevada, and there are more changes forecast. So we want to know how this might affect the distribution of these four mammal species in the Sierra Nevada knowing that they have unique, unique niches, um, knowing that their current distribution is driven by climate topography um, as well as land cover types. And there's a lot of regional variation in even how they're using those land cover types. This is a quote um, from a book on dynamic biogeography. And I think it sums up the importance of these results um, well especially when we're looking at how different species with these different niches will respond differently to change conditions. When conditions change over great expanses of the earth, some ranges may expand, whereas others may contract or vanish. The results of continuous changes in environmental conditions at different spatial and temporal scales, from fine temporary and local scales to broad, long-lasting and global ones is a permanent amoeboid creeping of species over the earth. And this in turn results in a kaleidoscope of changes in patterns of species ranges relative to each other. So just a reminder, um, this is our study area shown here and it overlaps closely um, with the southernmost distribution of these species in the Sierra Nevada um, and that's also often the southernmost distribution for these species over their entire geographic range. We used a random forest algorithm to generate the species distribution model. 
Um, and they, again, th this is done by generating the probability of occurrence based on the observed occurrences of the species and the environmental variables in those areas. The random forest algorithm is one of the best performing algorithms to predict species distribution based on occurrence data. And a random forest is a model averaging approach. It's based on classification and regression trees, but it's not as prone to overfitting as those are. The first step in our results from the random forest is to get an idea of which types of variables are most important in determining these, uh, the distribution with these models so that we can compare it to what we saw with the ecological niche factor analysis. And um, what we saw was um, in concurrence with the ecological niche factor analysis. It was a mix of topography, vegetation, and climate. Um, but what these plots show you is the relative importance of the top 10 predictor variables in the random forest models. And these are measured by an improvement in model error across the random forest models. This it, improvement in model error is called the Gini impurity, and that's represented on the x-axis. So terrain regness, listed here as TRI and slope, two topographic variables were the most important predictor for the occurrence for all four of these species. Land cover types were the second most important group of predictor variables, although you know, which one, you know, which type of land cover was, was variable differed by the different species. Again, meadows were the most important for Belding's ground squirrels and marmots. Conifers were most important for gold mantle ground squirrel <coughs> and rocks for the American pika. The remainder of the predictor variables included all of the climate variables um, and the remaining land cover types. The climate variable, these, and these were from uh, BioClim, the BioClim layer Bio4, which represents temperature seasonality, was the most important climate predictor variable for these species. So next, we use this information to model where the areas of suitable were, suitable areas were currently and how those might change in the future um, using the predicted changes to climate and holding topography and land cover variables constant in space. So I'm gonna walk through the results for each one of these species individually and then summarize the changes overall. This is the model distribution for our most meadow dependent species, the Belding's ground squirrel. Um, each one of these polygons is the shape of our study area, uh, again, shown um, here in the map of the far left. Um, and the polygon on the far left, this is the current suitability, the, er the, the suitable areas at the time of the study. The bluer an area is, the more suitable it, er it is. This center map shows you the areas of predicted suitability in 2070. Um, 50 years from, or 49 years from now. And this on the far right, this shows you the area and uh, how it changed, how areas changed. And so areas in red decreased in suitab suitability, the redder it is, the less suitable it has become. And if it is blue, that means it has gained in suitability. So what, what you can see, um, the map on the far right, uh, sorry, um, the predicted areas of suitability for Belding's ground squirrel currently was concentrated sort of along the crest of the Sierra Nevada in the northern portion. You can see in, in this southern end, there are only scattered um, spots of suitability. And where there's this, just these scattered spots of suitability, we didn't find the species in this area. And the Belding's ground squirrel is predicted to experience the greatest loss of suitable area due to climate change out of the four species that we evaluated. And then along with fragmentation of the existing suitable areas. And so you can see that here, this is our predicted future suitable area. And it's only very scattered suitable habitat, very similar to where we don't find that species now. Um, and only these consistent areas in the very Northern part of the range. So, um, this finding is in agreement with earlier predictions for both suitable habitat loss, as well as loss of connectivity for the species in the Sierra Nevada by Morelli et al. And the future predictions um, have much of the area uh, uh, showing, like, like I mentioned before, uh, looking scattered as similar to the area where we didn't find it during our survey. 
Um, so the Belding's ground squirrel, we know that they have already experienced range contractions in the Sierra Nevada over the past century. And our predictions indicate that if climate change continues along the current trajectory, the future of this species in the Sierra Nevada is really at best uncertain. But on a happier note, um, the predictions aren't so dreary for the marmot. Just like with the buildings, the predicted area of suitability, the yellow belly marmot generally were kind of concentrated along the high elevation portions of the Sierra Nevada, but they were um, much more abundant in the southern portion. Um, and our predictions actually include only a minimal loss of suitable area, with a lot of that happening along the western slopes, but increased suitability in areas of that upper elevation Sierra Nevada, primarily along the crest. And what we've seen when we look at the last 100 years is that the yellow belly marmot haven't shifted their range in our study area, although they have expanded upslope in areas of of central and northern California, as measured by other studies, they haven't retracted the range. And we know that marmots have responded spatially through attractions in the past. So if we look at paleontological studies, we see that in, North, in Western North America, marmots did change in their abundance and they shifted their ranges um, to higher elevations when the climate warmed. And that the lower elevation range of the yellow-bellied marmot shifted upwards by 150 meters, but since the last glacial maximum. So we do expect a spatial response to climate change, but it is possible that currently the lack of documented responses um, in this region might represent an extirpation debt at lower elevations. So um, maybe it would be interesting to see demographic studies to show um, whether or not there are young being produced or it's just persistent adult populations or dispersers. So notably different than the other two ground squirrels um, is the golden mantle ground squirrel. And currently we predicted really widespread suitability for the golden mantle ground squirrel with areas of highest suitability concentrated um, along the western edge um, with lower suitability along the crest of the Sierra Nevada, which is very different than what we saw for the other species. And our future predictions show that by 2070, the golden mantle ground squirrel will have substantial suitability gains across the Sierra Nevada, particularly along the crest. Um, and we know that the golden mantle ground squirrels have also shifted their range in response to past climate cycles. Um, it, looking at the end of the last ice age, there were fossils of golden mantle ground squirrels at substantially lower altitudes and latitudes than they're found today. But based on our findings, suitability for the golden mantle ground squirrels should increase throughout their range in the high elevations here in Nevada um, by, by 2070. And so you can see here that almost all of this are shades of blue, so increasing suitability. And last but definitely not least is the much beloved and much studied American pika. So our predictions show a higher density of suitable area in the southern portion of our study, um, both currently and in 2070, but, but widespread suitability throughout. And there are many other studies that have identified current and future suitable areas for the American pika, as well as drivers of distribution, as well as extirpations. Um, but those studies often looked at larger extents, like the entire continental United States, or at much coarser scales, or excluded all or most of our study area. And our study area is important because it includes one of the few areas within the continental United States where the American pika is predict predicted to persist even if temperatures increase by five to seven degrees Celsius. Um, and because of that, our study area really could be an important refugium for this species. And by 2070, we predict a, sh a shift in suitable areas. So the shift is basically to higher elevations along the crest of the Sierra Nevada. And again, that's consistent to what we've seen for this species in response to past climate changes. Other um, studies have found that the American pika shifted their range higher in elevation, both since the last glacial maximum and in some areas of the Sierra Nevada over the last 100 years. So although only limited range shifts to higher elevations have been documented in the Sierra Nevada so far recently, our results in the fossil record indicate that additional shifts are probable. Um, so 
what these model results are showing um, is that these shifts are probable in the future with climate change as it's predicted. So to summarize, as we anticipated, the pattern of gain and loss of suitable area was different for each of these different species with their unique niches. Um, and this is a result of the different variables that were driving them. Um, suitable area gained here is shown in blue, suitable area lost is shown in red. And it's important to note that while some species don't show a large change when we're looking at net loss, like the American pika, there is change that's happening. And there's a big change to which areas are suitable and not all of those newly, access those newly suitable areas may be accessible to the species. Um, all four of these species were predicted to lose some suitable areas within this region by 2070. Um, but the gold-mantled ground squirrels and the yellow-bellied marmots were both predicted to have a net gain of suitable area. And the other two species are predicted to have a net loss, with the building's ground squirrels being most heavily impacted. And we showed areas of gain primarily along the crest for three of the species, the buildings, the marmots, and the American pika. Um, and as anticipated by some earlier studies, the crest of the Sierra Nevada really looks like it will be an important ref regional refugium under the projected um, changes that are coming with climate change. So with that, we wrap up this part of the story for these species. At least in the next few decades, there's hope that most of these species are going to be able to persist in the high elevation region of the Sierra Nevada. However, despite the abundance of attention that's paid to the pika, the building's ground squirrel really does seem to be more at risk. And I, I think the moral of this story is that even when we're using the power of modern analytical methods and these amazing spatial data layers, um, we can really miss important fine scale details that can only be found by boots on the ground data collection during field studies. And I think that's gonna be increasingly important to keep in mind as we continue to um, more frequently use these models based on these spatial da data layers to make management decisions. Um, and with that, uh, my acknowledgments, um, I want to specifically acknowledge the field staff who collected the data on this project over the course of five years, as well as Rob Klinger, the PI on the overall project that my project was part of, as well as um, my advisor, Dirk Van Buren. Thank you very much for your time and attention.